What if this dream that I can see could change how things are to how they could be? Two letters, that's all. If takes a chance and risks a fall. If starts sooner, stays longer, keeps the faith. Gets back up, goes back to work, sets the pace. Tell me now, what's your what if? What will it take to scale the cliff? Who knows what a day will bring? What if? This changes everything. Well, hello, Journey. Good morning. Welcome. So glad to welcome you to our Apopka campus. We want to welcome those at Lake County. So glad you're with us out at Lake County. And we want to welcome those in our online community, really from all over the world. Maybe it's your first time back with us. As Pastor Roddy said in that offering setup video, every week we see more people coming back for the first time in a long time, or maybe your first time with us ever. We're so glad that you are here uh, to worship today. We have a couple of special flower arrangements that we normally don't have on the platform, and uh, I want to explain that to you in just a moment. We had a, uh, we had a, a funeral yesterday. Uh, for a lady named Jean Mueller. And uh, this is a picture of Jean. And Jean is one of the founding members of Journey Christian Church. In fact, Journey started as a Bible study in her home back in 1968. That Bible study went from 14 to 28 to 56, three weeks in a row. And eventually they met as an official church on April 20th. 1969 was the first official church service of Lakeview Christian Church. 33 members that day, Jean and her husband Grant, were two of those uh, founding members. And note this for the irony, April 20th, 1969, she became a member of that local church body. On April 20th, 2021, she met the head of the church in heaven, right? She died on April 20th of this year. So uh, I just reminded, uh, when I think about that Bible study that's grown now to reach hundreds and thousands of people, do the prophet, uh, God said through the prophet Zechariah, do not despise small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. So uh, just uh, thanks for letting me share that with you. Over the past two weeks, we've been diving deep into the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Many biblical scholars and theologians have proclaimed this chapter is the greatest chapter in the New Testament. It it contains some of the most cherished truths and powerful promises from God about our relationship with him in Christ. Over the last two weeks, we've looked looked in in depth at two of those uh, promises, The first one is this, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Last week, we looked at this great scripture. If God is for us, who can be against us? And Pastor Harvey Carpenter here out of Popka had a terrific message on that verse uh, last week. And Pastor Eddie Smith out at Lake County also preached at the Lake County campus. And I understand he did a Great job. And I just have to say again, we are so blessed to have so many good communicators, preachers of the word here at Journey. So blessed with that. In fact, they're so good. I'm just grateful I got here first. (laughs) We are going to wrap up today by looking at another classic verse from Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Read it with me. Let's read it out loud together. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Those three English words, more than conquerors, are really only one Greek word, and the Greek word is hooper nikeo. This is a rare compound word that means to hyper conquer, to over conquer, or conquer with success to spare. You see, it's more than winning a contest, it's a defining and dominant victory that demoralizes your opponents. On October 7th, 1916, Georgia Tech defeated Cumberland College in a football game by a record-setting score of 222 to nothing. It still ranks as the most lopsided victory in college football history. 
Much like in today's ranking system, margin of victory mattered back then too. So coach John Heisman, after whom the Heisman Trophy is named, ran up the score on Tiny Cumberland College. Here, look at this. This is the actual box score from the game. Cumberland ran the ball 27 times for minus 42 yards and had nine fumbles. They attempted 18 passes, only completed two of them, but six of them were intercepted. Georgia Tech ran the ball 26 times for 922 yards. That is an average of 35 yards a carry. First down, second down, touchdown. That's how it went. 32 touchdowns. They didn't even attempt to pass. And it could have been worse. They missed two, they missed two extra points. Could have been 224 to nothing. Here's the quarter by scores. 63 points the first quarter, 63 points second quarter, 54 points the third quarter, and 42 points in the fourth quarter because they're getting tired <laughs> running up and down this field. Georgia Tech didn't just beat Cumberland College. They gave them an historical beat down. They didn't just win the game. They had a hooper Nikeo victory. They were more than conquerors. By the way... Hooper Nikeo is where the word Nike comes from. In Greek mythology, Nike was the goddess of victory. Both in battle and in sport, Nike personified and epitomized victory. So the apostle Paul redeems that word and uses it to describe followers of Christ. The Nike swoosh is one of the most recognizable logos on the planet, and Romans 8 37 is the equivalent of the Christ followers swoosh. When I introduce myself to people, I generally don't say, hi, I'm a hyper conqueror. I typically use my birth name, but I want you to know being a hyper conqueror is my birthright as a child of God. And if you're in Christ, that is your truest identity and that is your surest destiny. And to think of yourself as anything less than who God says you are in Christ is false humility. And I want you to see this. Pride is believing something about yourself that is not true. False humility is not believing something about yourself that is true. And I don't know which one you have a bigger problem with, but I want you to know this for sure. You're not a victim of circumstances. You are a victor in Christ. You're not damaged goods. You're not whatever label your family or culture puts on you. You're not your IQ. You're not, a, you're not whatever degrees or titles you have. You are more than a conqueror through him who loved us. That is your identity. And if that isn't how you see yourself, then you haven't come to terms yet with who God says you are. Back to Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. What is Paul referencing here when he says in all these things? Well, to understand any text, you have to first understand the context. So let's back up a couple of verses and look at uh, Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul starts with the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he comes up with a laundry list of life's worst case scenarios from trouble to danger and everything in between. And you need to know that Paul is not speaking in hyperbole or hypothetically here. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul's life, you know there's a painful memory attached to each one of those phrases. So when he writes distress, he might be remembering the shipwreck during a typhoon in the Mediterranean Sea. When he says persecution, it probably pings his memory of getting pelted with rocks or the multiple times he was beaten with rods. When he writes danger and sword, he could be thinking about the numerous trials he endured before authorities and governors and kings, each time wondering if this would be the one to end his life. Each one of those words is a painful memory for the Apostle Paul. Paul once wrote that he received a flogging of 39 lashes with a whip, not once, not twice, but five times, which was the maximum punishment Jewish authorities could give to Jewish rebels. By that count alone, there was possibly at least 195 scars that crisscrossed the Apostle Paul's back. I don't know what your resume of pain is. I don't know what your resume of suffering looks like, but I know two things. 
you have one. And through him who loved us, you can overcome it. And I want you to hear this. You are not defined by what others have done to you. You are defined by what Christ has done for you. Amen? Amen? You're not defined by what others have done to you. You are defined by what Christ has done for you. I want to make sure you get that. And I know some of you have walked through some tough stuff. I know, right, even right now, some of you listening to me or watching online, you are going through some difficult days. And I know two things. I know this. Probably what we've gone through is not quite as much as Paul and certainly not much as, as much as Jesus, but he overcame and we overcome in his name because we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Then in verse 36, Paul, as he loved to do, he quotes an Old Testament passage to connect the suffering of God's people through the ages to the ultimate one who suffered for us. And here's what he writes. This is Romans 8, 36. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Where is it written? Well, that's from Psalms 44, verse 22, which is a psalm of lament to God in the midst of unjust suffering. The suffering referenced in this psalm is not the suffering that results from disobedient behavior or poor personal choices. No, it's the suffering that resulted because Israel was faithful at that time. And here we find a truth deeply embedded in Judaism and drawn on by several early Christian writers. God will save his people, not despite their sufferings, but through and even because of them. Tim Keller puts it like this. The Bible's teaching on suffering is profoundly realistic and yet astonishingly hopeful. What's he mean? Well, it's profoundly realistic because scripture writers throughout the books of the Bible tell us suffering is inevitable. No one escapes it. We shouldn't be surprised and shocked by it. The Bible is terribly matter of fact about the reality that the world we inhabit in its current fallen state is filled with misery. Yet it offers not merely a vague and ambiguous spiritual afterlife, but the hope of resurrected bodies and a renewed creation and a material world wiped clean of decay and death and suffering and all injustice and no other religion promises such a thing. The Bible presents God's relationship to suffering as both stronger and weaker, Keller says, than does any other religion. On the one hand, God is absolutely sovereign over suffering. It is never out of his control. It's always part of his plan. On the other hand, God has come into the world himself and actually suffered with us. Now, take a look at this. No other religion says that God is both a sovereign God and a suffering God. That is the theological foundation for why Christians can be so realistic and yet so hopeful about suffering at the same time. How do we know this? How do we know this? Well, to drive this point home, we're going to leave Paul in Romans right now, and we're going to pay a little visit with John in the book of Revelation. Would you like to hear a little Revelation teaching this morning? Amen. Might as well say yes, because you're going to hear it. <laughs> a few years ago, I did an entire sermon series on the book of Revelation. It's one of my favorite series I've ever done. Contrary to popular opinion, Revelation wasn't written to figure out Antichrist, Marks of the Beast, or one world government leaders. It's a pastoral letter written to a persecuted church to remind them that they're more than conquerors in Christ in spite of their present circumstances. The driving question of Revelation is not, what can Revelation tell me about the end times? Instead, the driving question is, what can Revelation tell me about being a faithful follower of Jesus regardless of the time I live? While Revelation certainly does discuss the future, its primary purpose is not to reveal secret dates on a calendar, but to revive struggling disciples of Jesus. And remember, the big takeaway from the book of Revelation we said is this, God's team wins, pick a side, don't be stupid. That's the big takeaway from that series. The book of Revelation starts out with an amazing description of Jesus in chapter one that causes the writer John to fall to the ground in awe and worship the next two chapters contains seven letters to churches that Jesus personally dictates to John, full of convicting truths and beautiful promises to every church. But in Revelation 4 is where the story really starts. 
And this is where John was given the revelation that gives the book its title. And here it is. After this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you. That's the word for revelation. Show you, reveal what must take place after this. John is being privileged to watch something going on in heaven. This doesn't mean he's been fast forwarded to some unknown time in the future, nor does it mean he's been snatched away to some distant location far away up in the sky. And this doesn't represent God's people being removed from this planet to avoid the awful events that are about to take place. I take it that when he says a door was open in heaven before him, that he is insisting on one of the main points of the book of Revelation, namely that God's sphere and our sphere are not far apart, and that at certain places and points they interlocked. Sometimes the boundary between them is like a thin partition in which to some people, at some times, a door is opened or a curtain is pulled back so that people in our dimension, earth, can see what's happening in God's dimension, heaven. And the first thing John saw in heaven was a throne with someone sitting on it. What God is doing is motivating his church with a vision of himself. And while human language is simply inadequate to capture the experience, the most prevalent image in John's vision is that of a throne. Eleven times in eleven verses here, he uses the word throne. In fact, the word throne is mentioned 61 times in all the New Testament, but 45 of those times, over two-thirds of the usage of that term is found in the book of Revelation alone. The throne appears in nearly every chapter of Revelation. Twice it's used to refer to a satanic throne, but in Revelation, Satan's throne is always on earth and God's throne is always in heaven. The true center of authority in the universe is with the one who's seated on the throne in heaven. The false centers of authority and power are the ones that are scattered around us in this present world. Now, I want you to take a look at this. What John sees is that God sits on the throne, and because he sits on the throne, the church will be able to stand. It's important that we never forget the persecution context that the churches originally being addressed in Revelation are facing. John, the recipient of the Revelation visions, is himself exiled on a prison island far away from family and friends, left alone to die because of his faith in Jesus. But rather than grow bitter and give in to a self-pity party, John entered whatever makeshift sanctuary he could find on the prison island of Patmos on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, and we're told he was in the Spirit. I want you to note this. He was on Patmos, but he was in the Spirit. On the island of Patmos, he was isolated, removed from fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. His freedom disappeared at the stroke of a magistrate's pen. He was no longer permitted to do the work of pastoring the churches in which he was so passionately involved. Exiled to Patmos was the Roman government's way of saying to John and other Christian leaders, we have the final word on your life. We set the limits and define the parameters in which you exist. But John was not only on Patmos, he was in the spirit. In the spirit means John was in touch with another reality. He understood that there is another greater kingdom to which he is subject. You see, the rulers of this world may lock us away in exiled places where there seems to be no freedom, no room, no release, and slam the door in our faces. But the big story of Scripture tells us there is a door that is always open to those who believe, and the rulers of this world are powerless to shut it. It is the door open to heaven, and we access it when we worship Worship combines the experiences of being on Patmos and being in the Spirit. In Revelation 4 and 5, John's about to take his readers into the throne room of God with him. With the pressure of suffering and persecution taking place all around them and the multitude of unanswered questions that it brings, no doubt, the first readers of this revelation were wondering why a good God would let so many bad things happen to them. I mean, if we're obeying Jesus, why are we getting put in prisons and on crosses? This was surely the dominant conversation in the early churches. Their questions are important. 
And in Revelation chapter six and succeeding chapters, their questions are honestly addressed. You see, here's what I know. We all want why answers. But before we receive them, John gives us a who picture. Because before you look around you, you need to understand what's above you. And here's what's above you. God is still on his throne. The fact of the throne and the fact of God enthroned is the revelation of the Bible. The throne of God is the central revelation of Scripture. This is the message of Revelation 4. When life seems filled with uncertainties, we need a center, we need an anchor, we need a firm and fixed point from which we can navigate forward. Matt Proctor says, for the sailor, it's the North Star. For the musician, it's Middle Sea. For the Christian, it's the throne of God. And Matt says this, the bedrock of Christian theology is the sovereignty of God. It is the conviction that our God is in control of the universe, our God reigns, and in worship, we center ourselves on God's supremacy. Because God stays seated, we can stay centered. So the throne in the center of the heavenly control room, we see that, but then John paints a picture of beings in concentric circles moving outward from the throne. In the first and closest circle are four living creatures representing all categories of creation. The noblest represented by the lion, the strongest represented by the ox, the wisest represented by a human, and the swiftest represented by the eagle. These multifaceted creatures continually give glory to their multidimensional creator and pictures the truth of Psalm 96, 13 that says, let all creation rejoice before the Lord. In Genesis chapter three, when sin entered our world, man's relationship with nature was fractured. Plants and animals, natural forces would now resist and could even imperil him. But in worship, we're once again united with the world around us. All creation sings hallelujah. And when we sing with it, we momentarily look backward to Eden and paradise lost. But we look forward to new creation and paradise regained when we will be at peace with our created order. After these creatures, the next concentric circle moving out from the throne includes 24 elders. The number 24 represents the 12 Old Testament tribes and the 12 New Testament apostles. These two 12s include the old and the new, the prophecy, the fulfillment, and everything in between. Just as the four living creatures encapsulate all aspects of creation, the 24 elders include all facets of the covenant people of faith who sacrificed and obeyed, preached and praised, represented by Jacob's sons and Jesus' disciples. All are gathered around their God-seated center. From creation and covenant coming together in praise, we see again the unifying power of worship. Listen, worship does not divide the natural from the supernatural. It coordinates them. Every sign of life, every bit of beauty, every spark of vitality, Hebrew patriarch, Christian apostles, wild animals, domesticated livestock, human beings, and soaring birds are all gathered around the throne of God and all pour out their praise to their maker. Friends, worship is such a powerfully connecting force. And true worshipers in spirit and in truth are desperately needed in today's world. I don't need to tell you. We're living, in through, we're living through right now one of the most polarizing periods of U.S. history right now. I listened to a fascinating podcast with Pastor Rick Warren this past week. Rick Warren is the author of one of the best-selling non-Christian fiction books of all time, The Purpose Driven Life. Some have called him America's pastor. He coaches and mentors more pastors around the world than any pastor perhaps in the world. And he said last year, we still feel the effects from it now, we saw five major societal storms dumped on us all at once. There was global infirmity, the pandemic, financial insecurity, social instability, racial inequality, and political incivility. And Christians were contentiously divided on how to respond to each one of them, and many still are. Someone facetiously wrote, rewrote Jesus' words in Matthew 18, 20 to read like this, where two or three are gathered in my name, there's gonna be an argument. <laughs> However, True worship of the one seated on the throne has the power, like nothing else, to bring us together. 
Someone has described congregational singing as the chief communifying force. And I don't even think communifying is a word, but I like it. As people literally get in tune with one another as we sing. And some of us just do the best we can, right? Worship has a unique power to unite us. In fact, in the next concentric circle of heavenly praise around the throne of God, we see innumerable angels encircling the four living creatures and the 24 elders and all sing with heart-piercing beauty. And then in the last and largest concentric circle stands this, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. In worship, we're we're united with God's glorious creation, God's covenant people, God's angel servants, and God's redeemed saints all giving praise to God. So when small struggling churches around the globe or large mega churches in the U.S. gather on site or online on the Lord's day to worship, We are joining an orchestra as large as the universe itself. We look around us, and it may seem as if the whole world is against us, but when we look above us in worship, we see that he who is seated on the throne is for us, and if God be for us, who can be against us? In Revelation 5, we're told that John sees a scroll in the hand of the one seated on the throne. A scroll to a first century Christian would mean scripture. The scriptures were meticulously copied on scrolls and then stored in synagogue. The scrolls of scripture were cherished deeply and respected, but we're told that this particular scroll in Revelation 5 is sealed and no one is found worthy to open the scroll. And suddenly John is heartbroken and he weeps openly and profusely. I wept and I wept, the New International Version translates. Who will carry out God's plan? Is anyone worthy? Will God's purposes go unfulfilled? Will his people be left untended and unloved? But then an elder seeks to to cheer the despairing apostle with these words. He said, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. And there's our word, Hooper Nikeo. Same one, Paul. Jesus has triumphed more than conquered. He's able to open the scroll and it's seven seals. And then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. John turns expecting to see the great and powerful king of the beast, but instead he sees the most vulnerable creature of all, a sacrificial lamb. But this lamb, though it has been slaughtered, is now standing in the center of the heavenly throne, gloriously alive. Clearly, this dead lamb now standing is Jesus. And John is left to ponder the meaning of what he's both seen and heard because what he heard was the announcement of a lion, but what he saw was the image of a lamb. So why would a lion, and a, why would a lion be pictured as a lamb? The lamb is mentioned more than any other animal in the Bible, and every time it dies. Everyone wants a lion for a mascot. No one wants a lamb. Here come the fighting lambs. Ever heard that? And many Christians want a Jesus who's eager to pounce on his enemies, and that's how they interpret the book of Revelation. And yet I think it's significant to note that Jesus is never again described as a lion in John's Revelation vision, but 28 more times he's called the lamb. You see, the lion is an ancient Jewish image for the Messiah, the king of Israel, and the ruler of the world. The lamb is the customary sacrificial offering for the sins of Israel and the sins of the world. And both are combined in Jesus in a way that nobody saw coming. But now in light of his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave, it makes perfect sense. And from this moment on, John and we, his readers, understand this. The victory won by the lion is accomplished through the sacrifice of the lamb. Jesus exhibited his sovereign strength through voluntary weakness. On the cross, Jesus conquered through sacrifice. The key to understanding this passage is realizing Jesus is the only one who unlocks the scripture for us. Remember, this revelation is from Jesus and it's all about Jesus. He's both the agent and the content of Revelation. All scripture is about Jesus. And listen, that's the only way that you can read the book of Revelation sanely or any scripture rightly. 
We have a real-time example of how this works from the story in the book of Acts. Some of you remember our daily Acts study we did back in February. Here's a chapter uh, that we studied, Acts 8. We're told that a Christian named Philip encounters a man from Ethiopia. He was reading from the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, while traveling through the Gaza Strip. And Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? The Ethiopian answers, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? Listen, this man from Northern Africa was reading, but he didn't understand what he was reading. In other words, the meaning of it was sealed to him. And then we pick it up. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who's the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And look at this. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. I get so excited about what I'm about to tell you. Don't miss this. Philip identified Isaiah's slaughtered lamb with the good news of Jesus. Jesus is the lamb who was slain and yet is still standing who unsealed the scroll revealing the word of God so that it was understood personally and immediately the perplexed traveler was no longer puzzled. Instead, he heard, he believed, and he was immediately baptized. The nameless Ethiopian becomes one more voice around the throne saying worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Listen, the preaching of the good news of Jesus is the key to unlocking the power of the scriptures. Preaching Jesus makes personal Jesus. Preaching Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection presents a personal challenge that invites participation in the never-ceasing songs of worship. Preaching the blood of Jesus reveals the great plan of God in the sealed scroll and leads to proclaiming, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from where? From every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Listen, we all want why answers. We'll get those one day in the presence of God. But before we receive why answers, we need a who picture. And this picture of a dead lamb now standing answers a question that every believer, past and present, young and old, has, has, to, has had to ask themselves at some point in their walk with Jesus. And here's the question. Maybe you've asked it this week. Is it worth it? Whatever it is you're do- dealing with right now, is it worth it? I believe. The answer to that question is with a question. Is he worthy? In Revelation 4 and 5, we see and we hear the voices of every creature from every century and every continent and every country and every culture and every color say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Amen? Yeah. Somebody ought to say amen. Let's stand up right now. Lake County, stand up as you're watching. I wanna pray for us. And our band is both at Apopkin and at Lake County. We're doing an encore presentation of a song we introduced on Easter Sunday. Is he worthy? So I want you to join me in prayer right now. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us just to be reminded again that Jesus is lion and lamb, that the strength of the lion conquered through the sacrifice of the lamb. Jesus, you are the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And we are so grateful, Father, that you unlock the scriptures for us, that coming to you and trusting in you, it unlocks the scripture. And so, Father, I pray that maybe right now some, something's been revealed to somebody. Maybe it's online. Maybe it's in Lake County. Maybe it's right here at Apopka. That they've had a revelation of who Jesus is in their life. Father, we, may we just worship you right now. 
We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It could be that like our friend from Ethiopia, you've heard Jesus is the slaughtered lamb slain for your sins, but is alive, he's standing, and he reigns with God. And you wanna receive that and accept that. We have our baptistry door open right now. You can see that light over there. You just go right on over there. We'd love to help you do what he did. He heard, he believed, and he was baptized immediately. But the rest of us, I just wanna tell you, we're gonna worship right now. We're gonna worship God together in a beautiful, powerful way. So join your voices as we join all those heavenly creatures as we worship God together right now. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of 